Why did we do that? It's because after the Spanish were chased out of Cuba and the Cuban revolutionaries were planning their new government, for the first time, we looked at their political program. And we found out that throwing the Spaniards out of Cuba was not all they wanted to do. They actually wanted to do something for their country. And what did they want to do? First thing they wanted to do is give land to starving peasants. Where is the land? It's all owned by half a dozen American sugar companies. And then the other thing we noticed was Cuba wants to build up a manufacturing industry. And the way they want to do that is the way we did it, erect a tariff wall so that we can't be flooded by goods from other countries and we can stimulate domestic manufacturing. Well, 90% of all the manufactured goods that were on sale in Cuba at that time came from the United States. So suddenly we saw, wait a minute, this revolutionary government is not going to be good for our corporations in the US. So we decided to abandon our promise to Cuba. Now, flash forward to 1959, so 60 years later. That was the year, of course, that Fidel Castro came to power. During the time I was researching that book, Overthrow, I uh, went back and researched that period. And I found a very interesting document. It was Castro's first speech as a leader of the victorious revolution in January 1959. He made it out in Santiago, the eastern city in, uh, in Cuba, where his troops first arrived from the, from the hills. And it was a very vague speech full of kind of patriotic platitudes. But Castro made one promise. He said, I promise you that this time it's not going to be like 1898 again when the Americans came in and took over our country. Now, that speech wasn't very widely reported in the United States. But if it had been, I think Americans would have had two responses. The first would have been, what happened in 1898? You know, we forget these interventions, and we like to believe that the people in the countries where we intervene are going to forget them also. But these interventions have long-term effects. And the fact is that if we had kept our word to Cuba and not insisted on dominating Cuba for half a century, we would never have had to face the entire phenomenon of Castro communism and all the negative effects that had for America over so many decades. That is another blowback effect of our own intervention. We have created that phenomenon. It's just that it was a delayed response, so we don't automatically make the connection. Now, I want to take a little more time to talk about Iran, because that is such a uh, uh, very intense debate now in the United States. It's, it's intruding even a little bit into the presidential campaign. Now, <laughs> just a bit. Um, here is perhaps the single greatest pattern that I, can, that I notice after studying so many of these interventions. It is the inevitability of unpredicted consequences. You know, we Americans have what some people call this can-do mentality, this great optimism. And it's, it's a wonderful quality. It's, it's what helped build America into what it is now. Uh, it can be very helpful when you're trying to confront obstacles that are posed by nature or by other people or by technology. But the can-do mentality can also be dangerous because it leads us to think that we can do anything. Uh, I think that was the idea that brought us into, uh, into Iraq. Don't worry, there won't be any problems afterwards, because we're America. We're going to be able to deal with whatever comes up. So this is a very dangerous uh, approach to the world. And uh, in Iran, uh, you see very vividly this law of unintended consequences coming back to haunt us. And we see that you cannot control the consequences of intervention they ultimately wind up hurting not only the country where we intervene, but also us. So let me talk a little bit about what happened in Iran and how did we get to the position we're in now. For the whole first half of the 20th century, the dominant fact of life in Iran was foreign intervention, principally by Britain and Russia, lesser extent by France and some other European powers. And bitter resentment grew up in Iran against these intervening powers. Now, during that period, the first half of the 20th century, the only Americans in Iran were missionaries and others who came to help. People that built hospitals. The American hospital in Tehran was the only place for decades where a poor person could get 
good medical care for free. Uh, they were educators. Uh, the statue of Samuel Jordan, the founder of Alborz College, which trained uh, generations of the Iranian elite, is still a place that uh, people in Iran go to pay pilgrimages of. They still remember the great American school teacher who was killed during the Constitutional Revolution in 1906. He was called the uh, Amer American Lafayette. So America was seen in Iran as the, the great country, the perfect country, the idealized country. They were not intervening and trying to suck our resources out like the British and the French and the Russians. America was even idealized, even beyond uh, perhaps what we deserved at that time. So America really was in the ideal position because uh, we were only helping, and that help was coming from private initiative. It was not a government-to-government -government relationship at all. Now, after World War II, the winds of nationalism were blowing through Asia and Africa, Latin America. And in Iran, nationalism meant one thing. We've got to take back control of our oil. At the beginning of the 20th century, through a corrupt deal uh, with the declining Qajar dynasty, the British grabbed control of the entire Iranian oil industry. Um, and. Uh, even Winston Churchill, uh, who was then uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, said very accurately that this was a prize from fairyland beyond our wildest dreams. Mastery itself is the prize of the venture, is what he said. So all during the first half of the 20th century, the whole British economy was fueled by oil from Iran. Every factory in Britain was powered by oil from Iran, every car and every jeep was powered by Iranian oil. The, the Royal Navy, which projected British power all over the world, was fueled by oil from Iran. Britain has no oil, nor have any colonies that have oil. Everything was coming from Iran. By the period leading up to World War II, 90% of the oil being sold in Europe was coming from Iran. And all the profits were going to this one British company. So you had this situation where a poor country whose miserable people were living in some of the worst conditions of any people in the world, had an enormously valuable resource, which was going to prop up the economy of a European country. So it was natural that when Iran emerged from World War II and became a real functioning democracy, that the leaders of Iran would reflect this great public clamor. We've got to take back control of our oil so we can use the profits to develop our own country. Well, naturally, the British were in a panic when they heard this. At first, they didn't believe it. One of their first orders was to uh, ask their ambassador in Britain to uh, approach Prime Minister Mossadegh or one of his aides and find out how much money does he really want us to put in his Swiss bank account so he can forget all this foolishness. But it turned out it wasn't just Mossadegh. It was the entire Iranian people. It wouldn't have even worked, even if you could have bribed the Prime Minister, because the entire people of Iran had grasped onto this cause. The British tried everything. They blockaded the port where the oil uh, was exported from. They forced all their experts who could run the refinery to go back to Britain. And of course, they'd been very careful not to train any Iranians in how to run that refinery. Uh, they prevented agricultural and manufactured goods from getting into Iran. They took Iran to the United Nations. They took Iran to the World Court. None of this worked. So uh, the British finally decided, we're going to have to overthrow the government of Iran. We're going to have to overthrow Prime Minister Mossadegh. They began to plan this, but Mossadegh found out what they were doing. And he did the only thing that he could have done to protect himself, which was he closed the British embassy. And he sent home all the British diplomats, including, of course, all the secret agents that were planning the coup. So now the British were really in a panic. They were losing their most valuable, richest, most lucrative pro property anywhere in the world. To who? Iranians? It was a, it was a huge shock. And then. What happened was Prime Minister Churchill decided the only hope for us is we've got to turn to the Americans and see if we can get the Americans to do this for us. So he, he approached President Truman, and Truman said no. The CIA does not overthrow governments. And that was true. That was true at the time. The CIA had never overthrown a government up, up to that time. It was Truman's idea that it could be used for intelligence gathering, but not for that kind of operation. In fact, while I was researching this book in the uh, Truman Library in Missouri, I found a fantastic phrase in one of uh, Truman's letters when he was writing about the CIA. He was very worried about giving too much power to the CIA.